Is it possible for two opposing sides to win a war at the same time? Well, during the Mongol invasion of Vietnam, it kinda happened, sorta. It is kind of an interesting war where in the aftermath, both sides claim victory. But of course, sometimes victory is just a matter of perspective. So why don't you decide for yourself? As I tell you the history of the Mongol invasion of Vietnam. Or to be more precise, the invasion of Dai Viet and Champa, as Vietnam wasn't unified yet back then. The Mongols invaded Vietnam three times, 1257, and after nearly 30 years of relative peace, 1285 and 1287. Before the first invasion, the Mongols were still trying to conquer Southern Song Dynasty. They've been at it for over 20 years by then, and those pesky Song Chinese just won't surrender. Seeing that they are not making any progress in the Northern Front, they decided to find new routes to attack Song. So Mongke, the great Khan of the time, decided to send a contingent to circle around the southwestern borders of China. Their requests for passage into Song were rejected thoroughly by the countries in the region, Dali and Vietnam, which was known as Dai Viet at the time, since they were allies of Song. So, resorting to the tried-and-true Mongol method, they decided to crush all the resistance. Dali was subjugated by Kublai, who wasn't the great Khan of the Mongols yet, and Uriang Kadai moved to attack Dai Viet. Uriang Kadai was the son of Subutai, Genghis Khan's greatest strategist, so this lad's got quite the pedigree, and also the prowess to back it up. Even when the Dai Viet soldiers brought their war elephants to battle the Mongols in 1257, the Mongols easily defeated them. Their sharpshooters targeted the elephants and caused the elephants to turn around and trample the Viet soldiers. Then, Uriang Kadai proceeded to take the capital, Tang Long, forcing the Dai Viet Emperor, Chen Tai Tong, to flee. The Viets eventually managed to take back their capital by using scorched earth policy, starving the Mongols by burning all the farms and moved all the food away from the capital. But before any sides could deal a decisive blow against each other, Uriang Kadai was ordered to move north to attack Song. So, the result of the first invasion was indecisive. Nevertheless, in 1258, the emperor of Dai Viet, Zhan Tai Tong, abdicated the throne to his son, Zhen Tang Tong. Having witnessed the destruction the Mongols had wrought upon his land firsthand, the new emperor decided to establish a tributary relationship with the Mongol Empire to maintain peace. They actually had an existing tributary relationship with the Song Chinese, so this is a delicate diplomatic relationship that they had to balance carefully. But this tributary relationship with the Mongols is a whole different beast from what they are used to. Tributes to China were really just a political theater used to enhance the Chinese emperor's prestige to their domestic audience. The tributary states would offer gifts to the Chinese emperor, and in return, the Chinese emperors would give them even more lavish gifts. This is practically the ancient equivalent of the Asian fighting to pay for everyone's bill at a restaurant trope. In addition, the tributary states would also be given the permission to trade with the empire, and the ruler would be granted a royal title to enhance their legitimacy at home, or maybe not if they want to claim the title of emperor themselves, such as the case of Japan and Vietnam. But they can just spin the story to their own people, since the exchange could be done by envoys. So it's not really that big of a deal. I will cover this in the future because it is a bizarrely fascinating system. But let's return to the main topic, shall we? So, becoming a tributary state of the Mongols didn't sound like such an awful idea at first, until they realized that the Mongol tributary system functioned in a completely different manner. They wanted to use the same model they imposed on Goryeo Korea. The Mongols demanded taxes, political hostages, women, military service, placement of their tax collector Darukachi into their country, and 
the most contentious demand of all was that the ruler themselves had to go to the Mongol capital to present themselves to the great Khan. This is obviously a very dangerous thing for a ruler to do. If he was captured by the Mongols, then his country would be done for. The Champa king, Indra Varman V, who also became a tributary, knew the danger of this demand too. So the Chams and the Viets did everything they could to get out of visiting the Mongol capital. In the meantime, they could only lay low and gather strength to resist possible future invasions. The two countries even managed to set aside their age-old rivalry in the presence of this common threat. Between the first and the second Mongol invasion, there was nearly a 30 years period of relative peace between the Mongols and Vietnam. But a lot of things happened in between that would change the nature of the second invasion. The most important thing is that Kublai Khan became the great Khan of the Mongols after winning a succession war. But the war also broke up the Mongol Empire into various Khanates. He no longer had the support of other prominent Khans. So he had to establish his Mongol Chinese Yuan dynasty and started using more non-Mongol soldiers in his various ventures. Nevertheless, he finally succeeded to conquer Song dynasty China in 1279. But this calamitous event for the Song turned out to be a windfall for the Viets. Prince Chen Guotuan, who would later be known as Chen Hongdao, the uncle of the reigning Dai Viet Emperor, had been gathering a lot of refugees from Song. Some of them were even military officers and he incorporated them into the Dai Viet army. The remaining Song resistance also tied up a lot of the Yuan dynasty resources in southern China. In 1282, fed up with Champa's refusal to send their king to the Yuan dynasty capital, Da Du, Kublai finally attacked Champa. Since they had lost most of their warships in their disastrous invasion of Japan, they could only send a limited number of men to Champa. But even with this smaller number, the Yuan army led by Soketu was able to capture the Cham capital, Vijaya, and force the king to seek refuge in the mountains and resort to guerrilla tactics. Meanwhile, Kublai was also becoming increasingly dissatisfied with the Viets. He thought that they've been sending inferior tributes. They refused to let the Mongol tax collector Darukachi in, and their ruler haven't even visited Da Du yet. The relationship finally hit breaking point when the Viets refused to provide reinforcement and supplies to the invasion force in Champa. So, in 1285, Kublai's son, Tohan, and his trusted commanders launched an attack on Dai Viet by land and water under the pretext of sending reinforcement to Champa. Prince Hung Dao, who was appointed as the commander-in-chief by the newly appointed emperor, was joined by the retired former emperor in the battlefield. And together, they put up a valiant defense against the advancing Yuan army. But unfortunately, not even their strategy of using stockades could stop their adversary's momentum. But by the time Tohan reached the Dai Viet capital, he discovered an empty palace because the prince and the emperors had evacuated to a safer place. Once again, they used the scorched earth strategy to starve their enemies out. The Yuan forces could not find any respite anywhere either, as they faced the pressure of Hung Dao's guerrilla forces from every corner of the land. Despite this, some collaborators from the royal family joined the Mongols, and they will be used as political ammunition in future dealings with the Viets. As the spring season rolled in, the warm weather and the lack of food started to take a toll on the Yuan forces. Their position was becoming untenable, so they decided to retreat back to China. But along the way, a contingent of Tohan's force was ambushed and defeated by the Song troops and native militia gathered by Heng Dao. Tohan only managed to flee the region with his small residual force. Meanwhile, down in Champa, Soketu was ambushed in transit and was killed by the chums. Thus, the second invasion ended disastrously. This, however, did not mean that Kublai had given up on subjugating Dai Viet. In 1287, he appointed Chen Iktak, the Dai Viet royalty who had defected to the Mongols, as the rightful ruler, and launched another expedition. Once again, 
Tō Han was in charge of the invading force. Most probably, he was eager for a chance to atone for his failure. This time, he brought a massive invading force of 170,000 men, including support personnel. Additionally, knowing the Fiat's proclivity using scorched earth tactics, he also prepared supply ships that will provide him with a steady supply of provision throughout the campaign. With this overwhelming force, once again, Tu Han blasted past Dai Viet defenses and occupied Tang Long, but this time he burned and looted the capital with unbridled vengeance. Hung Dao was sent packing, but he had not given up hope yet. The Scorched Earth strategy won't be as effective this time, now that Tohan got his provisioning ships supplying him. So he had to hit them where it hurts and attack the supply fleets. The supply fleet was turned away and high wind prevented the other ships to enter the Dai Viet water. So despite all their planning, the Yuan army starved again. As the spring season rolled in, the Yuan commanders feared a repeat of their past failures. So Tohan ordered a retreat with his men retreating by land route and the rest by boat. Upon seeing their movement, Hung Dao immediately launched a major counteroffensive. He deployed more than 30,000 men to block the northern exit and lured the ships into a classical Vietnamese trap at the Battle of Bac Tang. This was the same trick they used in 938, over 300 years ago, that won them independence from China. This time, it will save them again from the Yuan invaders. They had set iron-tipped poles in the riverbed, which would only be revealed on low tide. So all they had to do was to draw the Yuan ships into location and wait for the low tide to come. When it did, the Yuan ships were immobilized and became sitting ducks for the Viet fire ship assaults. In panic, many of the Yuan soldiers abandoned ship, only to be picked off by Hung Dao by the riverbank. Meanwhile, on the land route, Tohan's contingent was also taking a beating. Tohan was struck by a poison arrow and he narrowly escaped. Overall, this was a major defeat for the Yuan forces. Yet, the victors could not become complacent, because once Kublai pacified the Song rebels, they might come for Dai Viet and Champa again. So they re-established their tributary relationship, this time with better terms. Dai Viet paid a small amount of gold to atone for their transgression, just to sweeten the deal. So in the end, Kublai won! Well, at least uh, that's what he would like to think, since the two countries came back groveling to be incorporated into the tributary system. As for the two other countries, obviously they knew that they are the real winners. But what do you think? Do you think that Dai Viet and Champa won? Or are they the losers here because they did not receive any compensation for the destruction and looting the Yuan Empire did? Or maybe both sides won because there is such a thing as asymmetrical objective in warfare. The two countries just wanted to drive the invaders out while Kublai wanted to maintain their subservience. Comment below, give us your opinion. Anyway, I'm CJ and we release a video on this channel every week. So subscribe if you would like to know more about the history of Asia and other parts of the world. Until next time, stay cool my bros.